Uh, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Paola Moreno Roman. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Foldscope, and I am really, really excited uh, to be hosting uh, today's workshop. And uh, in a little bit, I'll tell you more about who actually will be leading today's workshop. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our company, Foldscope. We are um, our mission is to develop low cost scientific tools because we want to make science accessible to everyone around the world. And during COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic, when it began, we were brainstorming ways on how we could keep the community engaged. Um, that's how these full scope life workshops uh, kind of were born. And yeah, you know, it was just out of that need of sharing information through the tools that we had, which in this case is uh, Zoom. So yeah, so it's a, it is my pleasure indeed uh, to introduce uh, today to Harris. Harris uh, Molstein is a microscopy enthusiast and a psychologist as well. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And he also earned his Master of Science in Marine Science from the University of Texas. And uh, there he focused on uh, phytoplankton ecology. He um, is currently um, working, uh, well, when he was a high school uh, science, uh, teacher, Harris was recruited by UNCW, uh, the University of North Carolina Wilmington Marine Quest, to serve as their, their lead education coordinator. And he uh, has the chance there to share his passion for marine science and the microscopic world with students of all ages. And it was um, through, you know, that uh, through his job that, you know, he started incorporating Foldscope and he'll share um, with us today a little bit on how you can use Foldscope to investigate um, the amazing, amazing um, microscopic world that's around us. Um, so yeah, so Harris, now I hand it all to you and uh, yeah, we're welcome again to Foldscope Live Workshops. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to have been invited to host this live workshop for Foldscope. We've been using Foldscope for some time with Marine Quest and as, as a, I guess, a professional microscope user, being able to see what such an inexpensive, um, you know, microscope made out of paper, what it could really do. And if I could show some of my old advisors what I'm able to do with the full scope when what we were able to, the images we used to be able to get with a $10,000 microscope, their minds would be blown. So I'm going to share a quick PowerPoint that I have. We'll do a little bit of an introduction and then we will go and just investigate the planktonic world using Foldscope together. So give me one second. I'm gonna get this PowerPoint going. All right, so everybody should be able to see it. Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Yes. All right, awesome. So once again, I'm Harris Molstein. I am the school programs coordinator with the University of North Carolina Wilmington's Marine Quest program. Here at Marine Quest, we have a fabulous mission to offer programming that provides young people with opportunities to explore, discover, um, and value our marine habitats. And most importantly, it encourages them to develop into res uh, environmentally responsible adults. So that's really important. We wanna give them the tools, the background, the experiences that they get relevant marine science, you know, just, I'll say the word again, experiences so they know what it's like to be a marine scientist. Um, and today I'm going to show you how we can investigate plankton and harmful algae with Foldscope and how we do this with our students. So a little bit about me, why I'm here talking to you about plankton. Well, I began my career as a phytoplankton researcher. So here's a couple of pictures of me at the University of Texas um, where I am uh, studying harmful algae. So things that uh, grow in the environment, microscopic algae that happen to be toxic or harmful to the environment. Um, and I was an ecologist, so I would try to figure out why would these organisms that would normally be like in background concentrations in the water, why all of a sudden something in the environment would trigger them to grow and bloom. So I, so I was uh, trying to investigate like what nutrients they liked, what temperatures they liked, what salinity, uh, the light to dark cycle, what could uh, be responsible for them to grow. And when they do 
do grow. Um, sometimes they grow so much they discolor the water and we refer to these as red tides, but they could be brown, yellow, green. Um, and then they lead to all sorts of uh, problems in the environment, including fish kills, marine mammal deaths, uh, marine birds will die and people can get really, really sick. Uh, well, I also had the opportunity to publish uh, several uh, articles in scientific journals. And most of what I was interested in, once again, was the ecology, what in the environment causes them to grow. Um, and just really, really um, interesting that a lot of these harmful algaes are, are weeds, like anything you give them, they can use to grow, which allows them maybe sometimes to outcompete uh, another organism. So from a phytoplankton researcher, I decided I'd like to go back to school and I got a master's in education. I became a high school science teacher. And from there, like uh, Paola mentioned, I transitioned to informal science as the lead educator and school programs coordinator at Marine Quest. So here's me teaching an ocean acidification lesson in our, in our indoor laboratory, but I spend the same amount of time outside with our students uh, in our lab. That's the field, whether it's the marsh, the ocean, um, the beach, uh, 80 feet underwater scuba diving on a shipwreck. Um, we are really uh, providing these students with amazing experiences in marine science. Well, 2020 was tough for all of us, and it was, uh, it was tough for us here at Marine Quest um, with, with COVID. So we really had to switch and pivot what it is uh, to be a Marine Quest program, and we transitioned to uh, virtual online learning. You can see our mascot, Mo, got a headset and a microphone there to show how we were doing our programs. But it couldn't just be us talking at students. It had to be what we do. It had to be hands-on learning. It had to be an experimentation. It had to be research. It had to be data collection. So how are we going to do that virtually? Well, we came up with the idea to send our students these really uh, innovative STEM kits full of all the supplies they would need to do long-term research projects. And I have pictures of the same young lady who happened to go on the road during our program this past summer to visit colleges. So you can see her doing experiments in her house. This is her in her car, actually studying plankton in her car while signed on with us live. Um, and then this is her in her hotel room uh, doing a study as well. So our learning could take place anywhere. So we saw this virtual learning as a way to increase what we could do. I mean, I check it, I, I just, I'm flabbergasted that this young lady was doing this type of stuff in her car while traveling and in her hotel room. But here's the thing, I am a phytoplankton ecologist. What I really love to do is I love to expose my students to what Foldscope community calls the microcosmos. I want them to be able to look into a microscope and discover a new world they didn't know about, to open their eyes to research and, and careers they had no idea about. And so I really wanted to figure out a way, how was I gonna put a, a microscope into those STEM kits and ship them all over the country, even around the world. I had a, I had a student of, who was uh, working in Costa Rica with us this past summer. How was I gonna get a microscope to them? And as much as I asked my advisor, can I send each of my kids a $500 microscope? She was like, no, we probably can't swing it this summer. Maybe virtual learning is a success, maybe next summer. But Back in 2014, Marine Quest was lucky enough to participate in the 10,000 microscope project when Foldscope sent out a bunch of these Foldscopes so that we could beta test them and, and, and uh, kind of give them feedback at how they're used. And this is, uh, we were doing this with one of our uh, uh, Girl Leadership Academy programs we had back then. And just looking at uh, these young ladies pick up a piece of paper um, microscope and be able to see critters with the microscope, it was amazing, right? And that always stood in the back of my mind. And then I, and we use them uh, periodically, but we do have a set of, you know, professional microscopes in our lab. So we didn't use them as much as I probably should have now that I've fallen in love with the Foldscope all over again. But when I started using them this summer, I was absolutely blown away from what we could do with it. And every one of my students received one of these paper microscopes right here um, and this is all it is. And we're about to see exactly why these are such a powerful tool that anybody, no matter where you are, no matter your socioeconomic background, how much money you have, you could have a incredible tool for discovering and studying and collecting data on the microscopic world. So now we're gonna transition to something I know more about than anything else in marine science. It might not be something that a lot of people think about when they think about marine science, but 
I'm interested what you guys think about when you hear the word plankton. And when I ask a, a normal class that, guess what they tell me? Well, they tell me they think of the character from the cartoon show SpongeBob, right? And what's amazing is that plankton from SpongeBob is based on a real organism um, known as a copepod, which we'll see in our samples today. It's the number one type of zooplankton or animal plankton that are in the ocean. But when we talk about plankton, they're incredibly diverse, one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. Um, plankton, plankton doesn't really describe whether you're an animal or plant-like. All it means is that you're too weak to make yourself against the current. So things like a lion's mane jellyfish, which is huge, is a plankton because they're just drifters with the current. They have complex trophic structures and interactions. Scientists are still trying to under, un, uncover like who's eating who, how is energy transporting its way up the food chain. Um, they inhabit nearly every aquatic and marine ecosystem. So even if you're landlocked, if you have a pond, you can sample plankton. If there's a river, you can sample plankton. If you have a decorative fountain on your campus, you can collect plankton. When I was teaching marine science at the University of Texas in Austin, we collected plankton in the, in the fountains on campus. Um, there are biotechnology applications. So there's products we can get from these critters that can be used to benefit the world. And we'll talk about that a little later. And I might be biased, but they're absolutely the coolest organisms on the planet. Well, how do you go about collecting plankton? So I can go out um, and I can take a, a bottle and I can dip it into the water and there will absolutely be plankton in that sample, but it's gonna be kind of sparse. So it's not gonna be the most exciting thing to analyze. So what we do as marine scientists, we use something called a plankton net. And if you can see in the little, little square next to my PowerPoint here. So it's basically, it's just this mesh net very fine mesh material that allows water to pass through it, but the plankton get caught in it and then they get collected down in this bottle. So I'm gonna really quickly show you what it looks like to collect plankton on the video here. So this is the pier behind my lab. Basically, you just put this into the water and you drag it back and forth for a couple of minutes. The water is passing through those holes. The plankton are getting concentrated into that little bottle. I know it's, it's a little jumpy probably on your, on your screen, but it's not that exciting. It's just pulling this net through the water. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't have a plankton net, okay? Well, plankton nets are kind of expensive, um, and but that shouldn't be a, a deterrent for you to actually collect plankton because you can go out um, and you can get yourself some pantyhose, cut out the leg. Pantyhose is already a fine mesh material. I used a, a a metal hanger to make a collar here. And I just have a, a half of a water bottle at the bottom. And right here, you have a very inexpensive, uh, high functioning plankton toe. Um, that's a fraction of the cost of a real legitimate research plankton net. Um, so that is one way for you to collect plankton, even if you can't afford or you can't access a real plankton net. And Foldscope, your next uh, device you wanna make should be a pocket plankton net. And you can call me for details and we can, we can go into business together. But this is all you need, pantyhose, bottle, a little bit of metal wire and a rope and you're in business. Okay, so we've collected our plankton sample, okay? So it's ready for us to investigate, but I don't wanna jump into looking at a three-dimensional liquid world with students that might not be accustomed to microscopes. So I wanna start easy. I wanna start with some prepared slides. And what I mean by a prepared slide is you could just from a, a, a biological supply company, they will provide you with a slides that already have critters that are, that are preserved and stained. So it's easier for you to see them. Um, and I like to train our students in using microscopy, whether it's our expensive microscopes or whether it's fold scope, we begin with prepared slides. And that's what we're gonna do today. Um, while I'm getting my prepared slide ready for you, we're going to start with um, phytoplankton. So we already talked about how there's plankton. Some of them are zooplankton, animal plankton. Well, we're gonna start with phytoplankton. They're not plants, but they're plant-like. They're single-celled organisms known as protists, but they have chloroplasts and chlorophyll so they can photosynthesize. So these are the base of the food web. There's different types of phytoplankton, but we're gonna start with diatoms, okay? 
And while I'm getting my microscope set up here, you can see some views from the full scope of this prepared slide. Okay. All right, so if we can spotlight, and I can stop my share, if we can spotlight my fold scope view, please. All right, so I'm doing this live. This isn't a video. Um, and we're taking a look at some of these diatoms, okay? Um, you can see how we have some centric or round diatoms here. Look at these views. Um, this is a paper microscope that probably costs, I don't know how much it costs for you guys to make it, but it's under like $5 per uh, for us to purchase. You can see chains of diatoms. Some of them exist as a, like they, they asexually divide and stick to one another. Uh, living as a chain makes it so that predators have to have a bigger mouth to eat you, but it also makes them more buoyant so they be closer to the sunlight so they can photosynthesize. And then we have what are called pinnate diatoms. Um, they're pointy at both ends. Um, and I have a couple of pinnate diatoms over here. And look at these views we're seeing. We can actually see the plastids or chloroplasts they have and their nucleus that are in the middle of these protists here. So very common marine diatoms. Marine diatoms are the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the planet. So every other breath you take is derived from a diatom. So we should all in virtual land out there thank a diatom right now. But my favorite thing about diatoms is that they're made out of glass. They have a frustule on the outside made of glass and it makes it hard for them to get things they need like nutrients into their cell and things they don't want like their poop and cooties to go out of their cell. I'm a scientist, poop and cooties are scientific words. Um, you can see here, if you look closely, can you see those little dots that are speckling the surface? Those are actually microscopic pores that allow things in and out of their cell. Once again, this is a paper microscope in case, I, I wanna keep reiterating that. Look what I'm able to do with this microscope and the views we can get. Um, Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. Um, I've been teaching virtually for a long time. You'd think I'd be really quick at doing this, but it takes me a long time every time. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears to a, another prepared slide. Another type of phytoplankton here. These are the dinoflagellates. Um, they're photosynthetic as well, but these, one, these organisms have two flagella, dinoflagellate. So two flagella whip-like appendages so that they can move. Um, and this is a prepared slide you can see here. I'm just gonna play the video. Um, so we're not taking up too much time, but you can actually see the grooves on their cells where their flagella are housed. And you can even see the nucleus they have. Um, because once again, these are single celled organisms. And looking at our guide here, you can actually see that this is a serration um, type of dinoflagellate. All right, so cool. So another member of the phytoplankton community, dinoflagellates, and what I love about them is that they do have flagella. Um, so Paola, I see that I have some chats coming in. If you can just ask me those questions while we're going live, it's hard for me to see. Yes, I will take care of the chat. So uh, Iqbal is asking, did you stain them? How is pinkish in color? Yeah, so that's one of the cool things that happens when you just purchase it from a company is that they stain them so they're easier to see. Normally when you have a live sample, they're gonna be clear or maybe like just a slight yellowish color to them. So the stain makes it easier for you to see the parts of them. And that's a really good question, um, which, uh, which takes me to my next prepared slide, which I will do live for you, where we've now transferred from our phytoplankton over to our zooplankton. These are multicellular animals. They have organs, some of them have eyes, they swim around, they're eating the phytoplankton community and each other. And we're gonna look at a member of the hollow plankton. So organisms that spend their entire lives as, as plankton. Um, and so I'm gonna play this video while I get my second slide set up. And then we'll uh, share my fold scope again. And you can try to identify what this critter is by watching this video and looking at the guide.
once again, these are all videos that I took with the fold scope. I did not cheat and use uh, one of our other microscopes. All right, so if you'd like to share my fold scope, spotlight my fold scope screen. All right, let's see if I can find these zooplankton. Oh, there they go. Look at that. So easy. Wow. All right. So we're taking a look at the same ones you just saw in that video. And you can see that they have legs, they have antenna. These are affectionately called cyclops because they have one eye, which they use to look for light and shadow because they're eating things that are growing in the light so they can swim towards them. These are copepods. This is what plankton from SpongeBob is based on. They're the most abundant of all zooplankton in the ocean. They're members of the krill community. And you think about krill, that's what baleen whales eat. So like a North Atlantic right whale, a whale that we have here uh, on the East Coast of the United States, um, they eat about two to three tons of these guys every single day. Now, everything in the ocean basically wants to eat a copepod. So they have an ingenious way to escape their predators. And I had a colleague in grad school who had such an amazing experiment and she wanted to see how they escape predation. So what she did was she set up a lazy river like you would have at a water park. And so like the water goes around and around in a circle. So if you're floating in a tube, you're plankton going around with the current. But at one end of the, of the, of the lazy river, she put a suction tube. So the suction tube would try to suck the copepods in. But when the copepods would feel that movement, they would jump away. And that's what copepods do. They throw their bodies away. They jump away. Um, and she went Mythbusters style and slowed down the footage and put a scale bar behind them as they jumped. And she found out that if a copepod was six feet tall, um, and in honor of the Super Bowl being tomorrow, a copepod could jump six feet in a single jump. So if they were six feet tall, about a half inch taller than me, in a single bound, they could jump a football field. So pretty incredible. And she called them the superheroes of the sea. And I really do think they're superheroes, um, even if everything does try to eat them. Cool. So those are the zooplankton. Um, if I'm going to share my screen again. There we are. Harris, could you also talk about how they compare in size with the uh, phytoplankton? And yeah, so like for us, like is it like one eighth of an eyelash or like how, how big it is? Okay, so with the phytoplankton, they would look like teeny tiny dots if you were just kind of looking at them like in holding them up to the light. Whereas the zooplankton are a little bit bigger, but you could see them because they're jumping around. You can actually see them moving around with your naked eye. You can't really see the details, but you can see them moving around. Um, and we'll see that um, more clearly because I'm about to look at a plankton sample I collected this morning. So we're gonna be able to compare the sizes of the zooplankton and the phytoplankton, but typically the zooplankton are gonna be two to three times the size of these phytoplankton. But like I mentioned, a lot of those diatoms form chains so they can make themselves way bigger. So it's harder for those zooplankton to eat them. Great questions. Um, so, while I'm getting my live plankton sample ready, I have a couple of videos. On the left-hand side, you're gonna see some of the phytoplankton community. And on the right-hand side, you're gonna see some of the zooplankton community. So this is just to give me some time to get my fold scope ready to go. So enjoy some of these videos taken with a fold scope. And you might see some familiar shapes and things. All right, well, I think I'm actually ready to go here. Um, if you would like to share my fold scope view. Oh, look at that, right away. I have the member of the zooplankton community 
that is the most abundant. We have a copepod right there. We were looking at it from a side view, those red colored ones. But look at the detail you can see there. You can see the little hairs on its antennae for sensing water movement. Um, you can see its single eye, like I mentioned, it's called the cyclops. And you can see that it has a full belly. Um, normally it would be clear, but you can see a little bit of a yellowish tint and maybe a little bit of yellow poop that's about to come out as well because it's eaten phytoplankton and it's accumulated some of that pigment in its body. All right, let's see what else. Ooh, who do we have here? Oh man, oh my goodness. So look at this adorable uh, zooplankton here. This is actually a baby barnacle. All right, so you know those, those weird uh, sharp things attached to the underside of boats and docks. Um, they begin their lives as things that look very similar to copepods. Um, and they have, about, ooh, there's two of them. And they have about three days in order to find a place for them to attach and grow. And when they do that, they go through a metamorphosis and turn into what we more commonly know known as a barnacle and spend the rest of their lives blindly kicking out their jointed legs, trying to capture food. But I enjoy barnacles much more as uh, juveniles or larvae because my parents who are on this call right now can attest that when I was about five years old, I needed eight st stitches in my knee because I cut them on barnacles. All right, so let's see what else we have in here. Oh my goodness. We have a beautiful phytoplankton to look at right here, a dinoflagellate. And you can see this is another, that member of the serratium that we looked at a prepared slide of. And you can see the groove where one of its flagella is housed right in the middle. and has this really cool anchor shape to it. A super awesome member of the phytoplankton community. In the background, you see a lot of little chains. Those are diatoms that we mentioned earlier. Um, this long, clear one right here, this is another uh, diatom, and you can see where it has its chloroplast accumulated in there, and that clearness is because, once again, they're made out of glass. Let's see if I can see anything else cool. Ah, oh, look at this. It's almost as if I planned to have some of these in my sample, but this is my first time looking at it. So if you can see this chain right in the middle, if you, let me see if I can zoom in anymore. There we go. So can you see all those spines that are sticking off of this? Um, so this is a member of the phytoplankton, of the diatoms called Catoceros, and has all these sharp spines on it. And this is actually a member of the harmful algae community. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. How am I doing on time? Am I doing good? This is really fun to explore, so I apologize. If I'm going long, oh my goodness. This is another diatom right here. All right, so this is a Bacillaria. This is a chain diatom that moves like a carpenter ruler. It spreads out its chains and then it constricts on cue. Look at that. It constricts its body and folds up and then it spreads out again as it oozes along the bottom. So once again, this is a plant-like organism that can move around like this. And somehow all of those cells uh, coordinate with one another so they move together. So that means there's some signal being transmitted through each cell so it knows to move in coordination with one another. How cool is that? This is so exciting for me. I didn't know, you know, typically the time of year where you get the, the poorest plankton uh, composition is in winter and the worst time to sample is at low tide. So guess what tide it was this morning when I sampled? dead low. So I'm very excited that we have a dense sample to look at today. All right, there's our friend the copepod again. We see a centric diatom in the background. All right, well, maybe at the end of today, if I have more time, I will go back to this plankton sample, but I want to switch gears and go a little bit to some of the harmful algae stuff that I had mentioned at the beginning. So I'm going to share my screen again. Um, I should probably tell the computer to share the screen. Let's do that. Share screen, there you go. There's one zooplankton we didn't get to see and I have it in the video here. So I'm just gonna fast forward. This is that baby barnacle I told you about. But one of my favorite members of the, of the zooplankton is uh, baby worms. So this is a polychaete larvae 
And all those bristles are used for respiration It in increase aeration so that they can breathe easier. It also makes it harder for uh, predators to eat them. But super cool. You can see it had a belly full of probably diatoms as well. I can go back to him. All right, so you can see it's about to make some, uh, some green poop here if we were to watch it a little bit longer with the fold scope. So when we monitor plankton with our students, we ask them to collect a little bit of data with us. So as easy as, do you think the phytoplankton are low, medium, abundant, or are they blooming? Are they everywhere in the sample? And the same thing with our zooplankton. And we take kind of like the class average, and then we kind of plot what we see throughout the year working with our students. And what's pretty cool is that we can see um, which is student collected data that we typically have blooms of phytoplankton in the fall, and in the spring, the spring is a little bit bigger because of all the nutrients that are uh, left untouched in the winter and then also the heat and the sunlight. But what's cool is after you have this phytoplankton bloom, it's followed by a zooplankton bloom. So the zooplankton start to eat all the phytoplankton, their numbers start to go down. And it gets to the point where the zooplankton uh, outnumber the phytoplankton, they're out of food, and then they're going to crash. So we see this really cool predator, the prey and predator kind of uh, relationship happening. And this is just data collected with our students, which is super cool. Um, and we also uncover the amazing food web that is uh, the phytoplankton and zooplankton community just by scanning through really quickly with the fold scope, which is kind of cool. I can see the fold scope view in the bottom right. You can still see some critters swimming by every now and then. Um, you can actually see like what's going on here. The phytoplankton harvest the light. They provide the energy to everything else. And then those zooplankton are munching on them. And if we were in a bigger water body, we'd have things like shrimp eating the zooplankton and fish eating the shrimp and then marine mammals. But you know what? It all comes up back to us. Humans are at the top of the food web. So whatever is getting into that food web in the water is making its way up to humans, which is a good transition to talk quickly about harmful algal blooms. So harmful algal blooms, like I said, can grow so much that their pigments stain the water uh, or change the color of the water. And so a lot of times they're affectionately referred to as red tides, but like I said, they can be green, yellow, brown, um, and they can lead to massive uh, marine mortality. So massive fish kills. Um, marine mammals can die from uh, accumulating the toxins. Um, and for us, we mostly get sick because we eat contaminated shellfish. So shellfish that are happy filter feeding, just sucking in anything in the water. Um, they might be eating these toxic algae and those toxins accumulate in their tissues. And then we come along and we grab an oyster and we suck it up. And then we've just put a massive amount of some of the most toxic substances on the planet into our body. And that can make us really sick. And no amount of cooking a lot of these uh, shellfish will, will destroy the toxin. They're very, very hardy. Um, so um, while the shellfish aren't harmed, humans certainly are by eating the contaminated food. Um, there is a program through no, uh, I'm ahead of myself here. Um, this is an image over here kind of showing you wherever there's a water body, whether you live on the coast or you live inland, there are harmful algal blooms that really, that, cause fish kills and human intoxication. And this figure here is showing from before 1972, after 1972, it looks like the amount of harmful algal blooms is increasing, which is a big problem. Luckily, there are government agencies here in the United States that are constantly monitoring the waterways. And we even have a, um, a citizen science initiative through NOAA, the, North, uh, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration for uh, just normal citizens going out and collecting harmful algal bloom data. Just doing what I just did. I go out to our pier, sample the water, look at it with a microscope or a fold scope. It works just as well. And then providing uh, data on what you found. And in my area on the southeast coast of the United States, these are the 12 most common harmful algal bloom organisms that cause problems in our area. Um, and we have a data sheet that we complete whenever we, we do this about twice a month. And you can see here, all we have to do is say, is it not there? Is it there? Or if it's elevated? So 
Maybe you'll see one or two cells. Well, that will be, it is there. Maybe you see one in every single view of the microscope. Well, that's gonna be elevated and that could be a real problem. Now, not anybody can go out there and collect data for, for the phytoplankton monitoring network. You have to do a little bit of a training. However, we do a simple training with our students and then they help us to collect this data which is super cool. So they, they, get, the, uh, they get to be uh, scientists collecting data looking for harmful algae. So we're gonna take a look at some of the views we got of harmful algae using the fold scope. Um, and if there's time at the end, I actually have one of the most toxic, toxic organisms on the planet to show you live if I can. So taking a look at this guy right here, she'll look a little bit familiar to you. That's serradium, a dinoflagellate. And this is a view I got with the fold scope. You can even see it's flagella dragging there uh, at the bottom of it. Um, and this one is not toxic, but you can see it's really, really pointy. And when it blooms, those, those sharp parts can get clogged in the gills of fish and can also hurt them. And so that can lead to fish kill. So while it's not toxic, it's harmful to the environment. Another one that's not toxic, go away, serradium. Another one that's not toxic is this diatom catoceris. This is one we just saw in our sample. So we saw a live harmful algae. And these are another one that's just spiny, it's pokey. So if this is blooming and you're an animal swimming through this, it could hurt your eyes. It could certainly get caught in your gills and it can cause like cuts and lesions and lead to fish deaths as well. Um, and this is probably the most common one we find in our samples. But switching gears real quick, let's go to a toxic one that, we, that is commonly found in our water. Now you can see here, it's a pretty bad picture that they have in their guide. So if you look at my Foldscope video, it's not the Foldscope's problem. This one is just really small and hard to see. Well, this diatom is Pseudonychia. And Pseudonychia produces something called demoic acid. And demoic acid, when it when it gets into your body causes lesions or wounds in the hippocampus of your brain. So if you eat contaminated shellfish that have demoic acid poisoning in it, it leads to something called amnesic shellfish poisoning. Or for the rest of your life, you cannot form new memories after consuming um, these, the, the shellfish with these toxins in it. Um, if you've ever seen the movie, The Birds, the Alfred Hitchcock movie where birds are, are attacking people, that's based on a real event in California where the birds were, were had the toxin in them and they were literally dropping out of the sky and landing on people and crashing through their windows. And that gave him the idea for the birds. So a very common diatom we find all the time. Luckily it doesn't bloom all the time, but is quite uh, harmful. This is probably an organism I know more about than any other. This is uh, this one right here, Corinia brevis. This is responsible for Florida red tides. Um, and you can see, I can identify this from a mile away because it swims like a falling leaf in a kind of corkscrew uh, manner when you see it swimming. This is a very, very harmful, uh, harmful algae um, in our area, but more so in the warmer areas like the, like, um, uh, the Gulf Coast in Florida. Um, and what it does is it produces something called neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. So it causes a lot of neurological symptoms, um, but one of the craziest things is it causes temperature reversal. Say you touch a freezer, it's gonna feel hot, or you, or you pick up, uh, or you put your hand in boiling water, it's gonna feel really cold. So that's a weird one. But, and that it gives you diarrhea all the whole nine yards. But the horrible thing about it is that these dinoflagellates are so fragile that when they get into the waves and wind, they break apart and their toxin gets into the air. It becomes an aerosolized gas. So when you breathe it in, it causes you to cough. You got mucus running down your face, your eyes are burning. And if you already have like lung condition, if you're elderly, if you have asthma, it could be deadly. Back in the fifties, when this first started happening, people thought the government was testing nerve gas on them. But it's not all bad news because researchers here at UNCW in the building right next door to me um, discovered, and I, and that Sam, that video you saw was because I, one of the, the labs on campus here, the Algal Resources Collection, gave me a sample so that I can get some video of it. Um, they found that in addition, in addition to the 
uh, harmful algal toxins it produces. It produces another chemical that turned out to be an antidote to the asthma-like symptoms it caused. And this was uh, an epiphany for the, for the scientists that are studying it. And they teamed up with, uh, with uh, doctors all over the country and the world and now have successfully developed a new drug to treat cystic fibrosis. So a random algae produces a random chemical that can treat a lung condition known as cystic fibrosis where your lungs overproduce mucus. And this organism has the potential to be a new super treatment for it. This was our former director of the Center for Marine Science who ran the lab where this was discovered. And these are gallons and gallons and gallons of Carinia brevis here so that they can grow it up and, um, and harvest the toxins so that they can study them. All right, so how am I doing on time here? Can I do one more? Yeah, you can definitely show one more. Though. All right, so I grabbed an, uh, a sample of this one right here, Alexandrian monolatum. Okay, and while I'm getting this slide ready, I have a video of Alexandria monolatum. Once again, I got from the algae resources collection here, and you can look at this chain of dinoflagellates. Wait, again, I'm just getting my slide loaded into my Foldscope. And for those of you who have never used Foldscope, uh, they have a wonderful resources on their YouTube page that teaches you how to prepare slides and how to put it into your microscope. I would love to work with you on that, but Foldscope uh, already has those resources for you. And I wanted to focus on the organisms here. So if you can share my Foldscope view, All right, so try to get this in focus here. These are swimming dinoflagellates here. Let me see if I can find a good chain to focus in on. There we go. Go fast. All right, well, we'll look at some of the other ones that are in here. Um, so this dinoflagellate, Alexandrian monolatum, produces one of the most potent toxins on the planet called saxitoxin. Um, saxitoxin is a paralytic, and it causes paralytic shellfish poisoning when you eat contaminated shellfish. Um, and so if, if you get intoxicated with this, it actually will paralyze your diaphragm, and if you're not put on a ventilator, you'll suffocate to death. This literally is the most really the most toxic natural substance on the planet. Um, some puffer fish also produce saxitoxins as well. Um, before uh, we made it illegal in this country, the United States was actually stockpiling saxitoxin as a chemical weapon. And they even would give it in capsule form to their spies so that if they were ever captured, they could take that pill so they couldn't give their secrets um, to uh, enemy uh, combatants. Um, I can't think of a worse way to go, paralyzed, not being able to breathe, but it's that um, fast acting um, that, it, that it was a very powerful toxin. So um, there is, we have a question um, from Iqbal. Do they form chains spontaneously? Yes, so um, their chains can break apart and then they can uh, function um, individually. Um, but as a single cell, it will asexually reproduce. Woo, look at that one. They'll asexually reproduce. Um, so one cell becomes two, they're clones. Then they'll reproduce. So two cells become four and they're just stuck together, right? They're just clones that are sticking together. The bigger their chain, the harder it is for something to eat them. In addition, um, it's gonna be hard to, uh, while we're just looking at the sample live, but they all beat their flagella at the exact same moment. So a signal passes down from cell to cell instantaneously and they beat their flagella together. So they go in the same direction and more flagella together means that they're faster. So they can move faster towards the light or to get wherever they're going. And they do have an eye spot so that they can sense where light is and go towards it so they can photosynthesize. But once again, really, really cool organisms. But if I uh, were to eat contaminated shellfish, I could die very easily because it's such a potent toxin and why it's so important that people monitor the marine environment for these things so we can um, close shellfish beds, warn people. 
All right. Super cool. I could do this all day. I apologize if I'm going long. Uh, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint so we can conclude really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have also um, a Q&A session right after this. So um, if you have any more questions, feel free to write them in the chat or you'll be able to ask them uh, directly. And if you want to say, put another slide up there, I'm happy to do that too. Yeah. That's or any favorite. comments, yeah. <laughs> so. For monitoring harmful algae with our students, we collect data with them just like we did before. Is it there? Is it uh, or abundant? And we can see three of our most common ones we see, like Catoceros, that spiny one. It's abundant throughout the year. It's uh, present. Sometimes it's not there. Excuse me. Um, we have Pseudonychia, the one that causes amnesic shellfish poisoning. Sometimes it's abundant in our sample, which is really scary. And a lot of times of the year, it's just there in the background, not really doing much, um, but things in the environment will trigger them to grow. And one of them I did mention, Dinophysis, um, produces ochadaic acid, which causes diarrheic shellfish poisoning. You can use your imagination, the symptoms that that one causes, they're very unpleasant. Um, but we find that a lot of times in our sample, but rarely ever do we see that elevated. So this is just here with our students sampling on our peer. We find harmful algae throughout the year. So with that, um, once again, I'm Harris Molstein. I'm the school programs coordinator with MarineQuest. If anybody after this needs to get a hold of me, you could, you could take your phone, take a picture of my email and, and reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you and chat your head off about plankton and harmful algae and how we use them for our school programs. And if you wanna to go to the Marine Quest website to see what we're all about, um, to check out our summer camps and school programs, you can go to that website. Uh, but with that being said, I am going to turn it over to you now um, if you have any questions for me. Thank you so much, Harris. That was uh, really a wonderful workshop. And um, I know my favorite was definitely uh, the live samples. I think like most people, I love that we can still see the full school view and we can see another. You know, um, and it, okay. yeah, it just, I, I mean, I, we all are born scientists. We're, we all are, have curiosity when we are born. And then sometimes as we grow, you know, we get interested in other things, but it's just, so beautiful, all the things that you can find and see in a few drops of water. Um, so thank you so much for um, showing that to us. It was truly, truly fantastic. So, okay, um, who has questions, feel free to um, unmute yourselves. Um, yeah. Um, hi. Uh uh, thanks, uh, Harris. That was fantastic. And I really enjoyed the live videos um, uh, with Foldscope. So I have a question. Um, uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah. El Elgil bloom uh, also causes, um, uh, I mean, also decreases the oxygen that is saturated in water, right? So if you create a layer on top of water, uh, so th that is also another problem that I have heard of. So which uh, is more dangerous to aquatic life and ecosystems? Um, you know, the toxicity that they cause or uh, the, the lack of oxygen that, you know, that they do. Well, I, oh, so, I sorry, well, I think I'm getting some feedback from, from yours. That's really good. I didn't mention the, the oxygen depletion that can cause from these algal blooms. So a lot of algae aren't toxic, but when they bloom um, and then start to decompose, they, the, all of the oxygen is going to be uh, uh, taking up, creating a dead zone in the environment. And that right. happens way more than toxic algal blooms. The mouth of the Mississippi River here in the United States is a giant dead zone because the Mississippi River is basically the United States' toilet. All the nutrients from land and all those watersheds go into the Mississippi River, flow out the river, and at the mouth of the river causes these massive algae blooms that eventually die, and then the oxygen is used up. So that is an area where organisms cannot survive. They leave the area, or if they can't leave the area, they die. So the increase in dead zones around the world, I think, is one of the major issues we're facing in terms of uh, marine biodiversity because of just, just excess nutrients we're putting into the environment. And that's such a, such a huge, huge problem. And they're growing uh, globally. So lots of algae aren't toxic, but if they're triggered to bloom, 
eventually they're going to have to be, uh, they're going to decompose and use up that oxygen. And I thank you for bringing that up because I, I left that off of the topic because I knew I would <laughs> spend so much time on it, but it is such a, such a problem in, in the world. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm going to uh, uh, email you with uh, something different that is, I mean, I I'll email you later about it. So. I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah, Harris, maybe you can also put, I don't know if you have access to it, um, your email in the chat. I can also do that if that's, I, I can do it for you if that's easier. Um, yeah, right now, if I remember how to spell my name. Okay, uh, Mo, did you have a question? I saw you were raising your hand. Yeah, I have one question. So, yeah, uh, how to collect them, uh, samples? Can you how do, you, how do you collect samples? All right, so, sorry, if you can see what's all around me, I just have uh, just things thrown all over the place. So we use uh, these plankton nets to collect them and plankton nets come in all shapes and sizes. I have a giant one right here. So we're taking our students off in our research vessels. We have these giant plankton nets to take a, a really big plankton sample. And depending on what size range of the plankton community you're targeting, you would pick a different type of mesh size. So these mesh sizes come in very fine or coarse so that you can actually target what parts of the, of the plankton community you want, the tiny ones or the big ones. Um, but if you don't have a plankton net, you can just dip a bottle into the water, or like I said earlier, and what Foldscope and I are gonna definitely team up with in the future is we're gonna create a simple uh, plankton nets for you to make in your make uh, at home. Um, and this is just made with pantyhose. So I can't really, um, I can't target a specific type of plankton, but this will do the job, just dragging it through the water for a couple minutes, pulling it up. And what's cool about the home one is that you can just open the, the bottle right, bottle cap, and you can collect your sample. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you, great. That's a great way to, uh, yeah, using pantyhose and a small water bottle. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. Um, who has more questions or also any other comments uh, you may have for Harris or what did you think of, what was your favorite uh, sample, if you remember the names? And yeah, someone was asking about the video. So if you joined late or you just want to rewatch this, we will be posting this on the YouTube channel and sharing the link on our social media. So yeah, probably in the next, probably on Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And if you want to share my full scope view, I can, I can show the plankton sample live and answer questions. I'm good at multitasking. Uh, my wife wouldn't agree with you, but <laughs> when I'm doing... When working with plankton, I, I can. Yeah, I just spotlighted um, the full scope view. So yeah, any any comments or other questions you may have for Harris? This is an antenna of one of the copepods, and you can see all the little hairs that are on it. Oh, uh, that barnacle is not doing so good. Oh no, it's not jumping around anymore. <laughs> So Harris, could you talk a little bit more about how do you engage your students in um, this uh, projects you were talking about, um, monitoring harmful algae? Well, I mean, the ability to put a mic, so I don't know about everybody else's uh, kind of experience with microscopes in their life, but a lot of times your first time using a microscope might be in middle school or high school and the microscopes you have Maybe they haven't been serviced in a while. Maybe they're old or outdated. And a lot of times the first time you're using a microscope through no error of your own, you just cannot get a good view of what you're trying to see. And a lot of people are turned off because they failed once with a microscope and they're like, well, that kind of wasn't for me. I don't really, I'm not really interested in that. So providing students with step-by-step -step instructions working together to get something in view for the first time can literally change their lives. And that's why I like to start with those prepared slides. So immediately there's something there for them to look at. Whether we go to their schools with these fold scopes or we, or we take our, our, our other microscopes, it's like 
Like, I can't believe, like they look at the slide, they're like, there's nothing there. And then they put it on the microscope and their minds are blown. Um, so just being able to give them an experience with a microscope that works, that we're giving them the proper instruction and the time and care that they need to take a look at a sample. They feel like they've accomplished something that they're able to, to view some of these organisms there. And that really is your in. Um, once you show them their first baby barnacle like this, their, their world has changed. Um, they think about the last time they opened their mouth in water and what could they possibly could have eaten and swallowed by accident. Um, and then they learn that of the complicated life history of these organisms. Um, they learn how things are eating other things. They learn how toxins are building their way up the food web. So I think just engaging them with a good microscopy experience is your first way to win them over to, to teach them about plankton. Um, Harris, I have a question. I, I actually uh, thought of emailing you all that, but then I thought I, will, I can't control my excitement. So um, <laughs> the question is, uh, with the full scope, you, you can take a sample and try to essentially quantify uh, what are the different kinds of algae there are, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But the thing is, is, it, is there a way to quantify the extent of bloom, like how much of the bloom is there? Let's say I go to a, a, a freshwater body, like a pond or a lake, right? And I take a tiny bit of sample there. But the question is like, I, I would definitely find out something about what kind of algae is there. But if I have to quantify how much is the bloom there at that point in time? All right, so you could uh, come, come back to me when I was in grad school and I would sit in front of a microscope and I would actually count dots and I would count the number of dots that were in a milliliter of water and then we would estimate what that would be in a liter. So how many cells per milliliter, how many cells per liter. Um, basically with our students, it's, we do it simply. If you see um, a few of them, it's present. If you see um, like every single view, you move it over, you see some, it's abundant. If it's something that's 90% of your sample or more, it's a bloom, right? Ah. So with our students, we try to simplify it like that. Um, sometimes when it's a bloom, it's way too much for you to count. So you dilute it. So you take a, like a known quantity and you put it into another known quantity. And so like you get a, a sample that's one tenth it's, it's, uh, it's, its density. And then you just kind of multiply it by 10 to get what it really was because it's just overwhelming when there's a bloom it's everywhere it's got to right. be everywhere if it's changing the color of the water right. um, it gets so dense like the what i studied in texas the texas brown tide it prevented light from making it past it so anything right below the surface that needed light guess what they're they're gonna die and that's right. what the texas brown tide would do would kill all the seagrass so i'm looking right here i have a one of those catoceruses right there you can see the spiky diatom right well, the sample that you have right now, uh, would you call it um, uh, a decent amount of uh, algae present in the water, water body where you picked it up from? Uh, no, I would look at this and say, this is, uh, if I was teaching this in a class, I would be kind of bummed out that there's not as much as I'd like mm -hmm. to see. Um, so this is a kind of a low density sample, but it's, this is the time of year. It's in the winter. I'm also at low tide when everything's kind of been transported out of the area. Um, this, is a, this is not a dense sample, but even, even me considering it not dense, um, if I zoom in here, all of those chains, that's all diatoms, that's all phytoplankton. So think about what it looks like on a, on a dense day. You basically, like everything is swimming through a matrix of diatom chains. Like it's just the, basically they're swimming through a, a diatom soup <laughs> on like a, a very dense sample. Gotcha, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we have a question by Jennifer, and Jennifer, I don't know if you want to mute yourself. I can also ask it on your behalf. Okay, I can just read it. Um, so she's asking, what is your setup for showing us your full scope um, view right now? It is so easy. I just signed into Zoom with my cell phone. And so there's my face. There's my computer. So we're just, it's connected to my phone. So there's a coupler. Um, can you make my screen bigger, my Harris Molson? Yeah, I'll, spot, I'll spotlight you instead. All right, so on Foldscope, that little metal piece is magnetic to a little coupler that you attach to your phone. And I just use um, some tape here to attach the coupler to my phone. So my phone is signed into Zoom. So it's just another account and then 
it clips right onto there. And then you have a light source that's magnetic. They thought of everything. I'm, I'm so uh, like odd and, and just like, I feel not worthy. <laughs> Foldscope is so amazing. Look at, look how easy that is. Um, and then I can teach a program on Zoom. In fact, I'm working with schools where the entire school class is getting Foldscopes and we are gonna do a plankton lesson that's gonna end with me teaching them the tips and tricks to use a Foldscope so they can continue looking at plankton afterwards. So they're not in class, they're virtually learning, but every single one of them is going to have a Foldscope and I'm gonna teach every one of them how to analyze plankton and then how to use the Foldscope. Which is, which is gonna be amazing. And I can show them uh, the real views here. Um, I was in the process of putting another plankton sample in there. I don't know if it's gonna be any better than the one before, but if you wanna go back to the Foldscope view, so yeah. while people are thinking about any other questions. Yeah, yeah, um, Ayunitia said, um, uh, that they have had to leave, but that it was a very interesting topic. So I just, you know, wanted to share that with you. Uh, it's indeed oh, awesome. it's been a fantastic workshop. Wow. There's another one of those harmful diatom chains right there, Ketoceros. You can see those spines. Well, if there's no more questions, this has been an absolute pleasure uh, showing you how we use a full scope here at Marine Quest okay. to, uh, to look at plankton and study it and just you know expose students everywhere, no matter where they are, if they're in class or their homes to the wonders of the, of the microscopic world. So I have a quick uh, question. Do you think, um, what do you think, so, because you're using a light source, right? Um, yes. What do you think it's the effect of that um, as you're looking at the sample? Do you think it makes them more active? Um... So life under a cover slip can't be fun. So, you're, so just on a slide, think about an organism that's normally in a three-dimensional environment. Well, you're immediately putting them in a two-dimensional environment. So a lot of the times they're gonna be swirling and swimming through the water. Now they can only kind of move in one plane around. So that's one thing that's gonna be bad. Um, but then you're frying them with a light source. So on a microscope, um, the light source is way more intense. And in fact, if you keep them on the slide for too long, they're gonna heat up and they're gonna, they're gonna start to, to die a little bit. Um, but the light source with Foldscope, it's like probably an LED light. I don't think it gets too hot. Um, and, it's, and it's not as bright as that on a microscope. So it definitely impacts them. A lot of these are phototoxic, like they, they are attracted to light. So having the light there might cause them to actually move towards the, towards the light. So it might impact their behavior a little bit, mm -hmm. but I don't think this light source is harming them so much as opposed to like on a normal microscope where they can get fried. Well, if there are, um, yeah, thanks for that. If there are no more questions, um, then I just wanna thank again, Harris for this amazing workshop. Um, and thank to all of you for attending. We will be hosting Foldscope Live workshops in the next few months. So just follow us on social media to, uh, and sign up to our newsletter um, to learn about the next time that's happening. As I mentioned, um, we will be sharing uh, this recorded video on our YouTube channel in the next week. So also keep an eye out on that. And Harris, is there anything else you wanna say um, before we end this workshop? Uh, plankton are amazing. If you can uh, expose yourself or, or students of all ages, like there's so many careers out there in studying plankton. And I, I touched on a little bit, the harmful algal bloom that causes uh, respiratory distress. Well, there is a toxin in it or a chemical that's now going to be used to treat cystic fibrosis. The world can change from somebody discovering a love of plankton and, and, and figuring out uh, you know, why they bloom how to grow them in the lab, extract chemicals they produce, create new types of pharmaceuticals. So a lot of people don't know about plankton, but if, if, if you kind of spark their interest, literally you could change the world. And that's what I love about um, being a marine science educator uh, and working at Marine Quest, because I get to do that all the time. Um, and once again, if you're interested in uh, the Marine Quest program, just Google Marine Quest or email me. Um, and I'm happy to talk about what we can do with you and your students 
um, your friends, your family. Um, but it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harris. Yeah, and if you have any Foldscope related questions, you can just email me at paola at foldscope.com. I left my email also in the chat. And yeah, you can learn more about Foldscope at foldscope.com. So again, thanks everyone for joining um, today and um, have a good day or, you know, good evening, depending on what's your time zone. Bye. Bye everyone. Good job. <laughs> I see some people clapping. <laughs> Well, that's, some of them are my mom and dad. They have to. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, Mo. Bye. Amy. It's that was terrific. Great job. Wonderful. Thank you, mom and dad. You're welcome, Harry. Nice to meet you, Paolo. <laughs> nice to meet you. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.